everyone, and welcome. I'm Kelly Redder, Executive Director of the Joseph M. Lobazo Alumni House on the RIT campus. And while the house is currently closed, except for appointment only, we are taking reservations, and I encourage you to check out our website in the chat box. As you think about your future family gatherings, reunions, weddings, retirements, business meetings, conferences, book signings, uh, this is a wonderful way to reacclimate to RIT. Many in our RIT family have asked how they can help our students in the university in light of all that's happening in the world this past year or year and a half. We are incredibly grateful for those offers. And there are two ways that you can help. First, our new graduates and current students are seeking positions for full-time careers and co-ops. If your company's hiring, please contact RIT's Career Services Office and allow them to post that position in our systems. In addition, there is now an unprecedented need for financial aid scholarships for both our in-person and virtual Tiger students. In honor of our special guest tonight, we'd like to highlight the Dean's Fund at the College of Art and Design. Note that support of this area will be counted in RIT's historic billion dollar campaign, which has just breached the 785 million mark. If you're able, please make a gift at the link in the chat box. We're getting close folks and thank you. Now, just a few housekeeping points. All attendees have joined in mute mode. However, your questions can be entered in the chat or question boxes at any time throughout the discussion. We'll make every effort to address your comments and questions throughout the webinar. This webinar is being recorded and will be shared with you in the coming weeks. If you have any technical questions, please feel free to type those into the chat box as well, and we'll do our best to get you the appropriate answers. Tonight's event is sponsored by the Lobazo Alumni House as part of the Alumni Actor, Artist, and Author Series, celebrating engagement with an artist, author, or actor who graduated from RIT and has found success in their passion for the fine literary or performing arts. Welcome to D. Major Cohen, whose crooked mile journey from his enrollment in RIT's photography program to author of Copy for Dummies is eclectic and wonderful, much like copy itself. Today, copy is one of the world's most highly traded commodities, and according to the National Copy Association, it's the most consumed beverage aside from water. For most people, coffee gets the day started and then continues to get us through the day, going through the day. So how did the beverage grow into the cultural phenomenon that it is? Major's gonna fill us in, but first let's get him to share some personal background and some insights. Um, Major, again, thanks for joining us this evening. This evening. Um, what made you first choose to attend RIT? Uh. That's a loaded question, Kelly, and let me say thank you first for inviting me to join you and uh, thank you to everybody who has tuned in. Uh, it's really an honor and uh, it's almost unimaginable for me when I think back, especially to that time when I was in college. Uh, I actually wasn't sure uh, about college, uh, nor were the colleges too sure about me, uh, but I was fortunate that I ended up at Alfred University. And while I was at Alfred uh, doing rather poorly uh, and uh, wondering what the future would be, I uh, traveled up to RIT one day with a good friend, uh, having started taking photographs uh, for the Alfred School newspaper and just fiddling in the darkroom. And the darkroom, yes, this is before the days of digital photography, uh, but I, I came up to RIT with a good friend who was looking to get a transfer into the School of Photographic Arts and Sciences. And one of the things that I think will come through during this time that we spend together is uh, I'm not bashful uh, and I have no problem uh, putting forward myself or if I have an idea, that idea. And so that day that I traveled up to RIT, I carried a box of photographs that I had been working on. And when my friend came out of his interview with the Dean, I stood up and introduced myself to the Dean and I wondered if he would look through my photographs to give me some feedback. Uh, I have no that. doubt I took him by surprise, uh, but he took me by surprise because not 20 minutes later, he made a call and I got up from his desk having been invited to join a special program in the summer. And if I had success during the summer, I would be offered a transfer and I left Alfred uh, that day and I transferred to RIT and went from a really poor student to having 
really great success at RIT and have nothing but the fondest memories of those years that I became a photographer. So what was your fondest memory as a student? I, I, as I reflect on that, I, I think that what, what I didn't expect, having struggled through school, I didn't expect actually to have success. And when I began to have success, I really, that success was fostered by two professors, uh, John Fall, uh, one, of the, one of the greatest photographers to have lived in the United States, unfortunately no longer alive, and another Betty Hahn. And we were in this program with John Fall and Betty Hahn, who were the most creative, somewhat outlandish people I had ever encountered. And I realized right away that they were going to accept me for who I was, and they were going to foster the passion and the curiosity that I had as a, as a fairly new photographer. And, and because of them, I feel as though, I, not only did I flourish, I had success as a photographer and, and, I, and I thoroughly enjoyed it, but I think that they began something in me that is a thread that I see through all of the things that I've done, which is that belief in myself and also no fear in being passionate and curious. That's about the best memory that you could possibly have is identifying that moment. It's an amazing feeling. I love it. Uh, out of curiosity, did you drink coffee in college? You know, I drank, I drank a lot of bad RIT coffee because you remember that if, you, if you're, and again, here, here goes Major off on the history of, of coffee, but if you go back to the 19, early 70s, 69, 70, 71, uh, we were still drinking some really rank coffee in the United States. What, what we've all come to enjoy specialty coffee hasn't been invented yet. You know, there's a guy in San Francisco who's just getting a business started and the next thing you know, but I drank a lot of really bad RIT coffee. Do you remember because, Sanka growing up? Yeah, I remember, I remember Sanka oh very gosh. well. Yep. That was one oh of my, gosh. one of my grandmother's favorites. I have to tell you, and, and I really didn't know the difference. I mean, think about it. We really don't know that, that difference. It smelled like coffee, but it, it, it sort of all smelled, uh, compared to today, it, it really all smelled pretty bad, uh, but it was coffee and, and, and people consumed it and have for quite some time. So let's take the next step here. Um, why don't you share a little bit about your life immediately post RIT? Well, when I left RIT, I had every intention of going back to Boston to work as a commercial photographer uh, with my degree and my love for photography. And I was uh, really uh, fortunate to have been invited by the headmaster of a small private school where I had been a camp counselor doing photography and some ceramics. And he invited me to the school one day and said that he had an opening for a part-time photography program that was just starting. Uh, the, school, the school was Beaver Country Day School, a, a lovely school in, in Chestnut Hill, Massachusetts, with a really substantially uh, established arts program. Uh, I, I, in high school, I, I went out with girls from Beaver Country Day School. So I knew the school, it was right near my home, but I, I was sitting with this headmaster and he essentially offered me a part-time job and said, if, if I had success with the program and built a photography program for Beaver, the larger the program got, the larger my job would get. Oh. And, and quite honestly, 20 years later, having been on the board, having been an incorporator for the school, and having been the head of the art department, I decided to leave. But I had a fantastic, fantastic career at Beaver Country Day School. And uh, I, I love the school to this day and all of my memories from there are, are really fun. So how did your experience with students uh, prepare, prepare you for your Starbucks career? Or can with you? Actually, share a little bit about your transition from. Yeah, I, I think you know it, when I look at it, it's 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 an absolute natural transition because what I discovered at at Beaver was that I 
I had a capacity to simplify in a way that I believe makes you successful as a teacher. Perhaps it makes you successful in life, but I, I think I could take things that, was, that were complex, photography in particular, especially at that time. Remember, again, we're in the dark room. And I, and I had a capacity to make it simple. And I, I guess I had a capacity to make it fun. And, uh, and, and so I, I realized that, that I, was, I was successful as a, as a teacher. And now, if you think about what happens, I, I decide that I'm going to leave Beaver Country Day School after 20 years to, to do what I had been ready to do 20 years earlier, which was to be a photographer commercially. And I began to work as a freelance photographer at exactly the time when Starbucks opens its first store in Boston. And this is the moment in my life where my love for coffee and my love for, I could say photography, but, but really my love for uh, teaching, be, they come together because as a photographer, uh, <laughs> I was freelancing and I had given up my medical benefits at Beaver Country Day School. I was going to Starbucks virtually, well, I was pretty much living in Starbucks, the Coffee Connection, which was another coffee company at that time in Boston and in Dunkin' Donuts. And I was meeting clients and I was enjoying the fact that it was a wonderful community wherever I went in any of those three places, I felt part of the community. And one day a supervisor in the uh, Stewart Street Starbucks, a wonderful, wonderful woman whose name is Lori Hare. Uh, and uh, she was a supervisor, a shift supervisor. And she stood up one day behind the counter as I was ordering and said, could I, could I step aside and have a chat? And I, I was in my business clothes. I, I was ready to be my, I was, that, I was a photographer that day. At any rate, uh, we stepped aside and uh, she said to me, had I ever thought about being in the coffee business? And I said, no, I never had. And she said, well, you love coffee, clearly. You love to talk to people. You love to talk to us. We feel like we know you and that we really don't know you, but we've been talking. We think you would make a good barista. So I, I said to her, and if you think about this, this really sets the date because at that time in, in, those, in 1995, the world had not discovered Starbucks and the world had not discovered the barista role. And so I said to her, Lori, what's a barista? And she said, well, that's us. That's what we do. And I said, oh, okay. You know, and I said, well, can you tell me more? And she said, yeah, well, we, we sell coffee and we talk to people and you have to know a lot about coffee and you'll learn how to use the register and things like that. And I, I'm sure I looked completely taken aback because uh, she came, she went on further to convince me with the idea that I would make $6 an hour, I would get my medical benefits. And she said very, very clearly, oh, do you get medical benefits? And I said, no, I don't now because I, I gave up my full-time job. And she said, well, you could get benefits for you and your wife. And she said, are you married? And I said, well, you know, Anne, Anne would be included too. And so the next week I actually, having had a wonderful conversation with Anne, and, and I'm gonna take a side here and just tell you that this was one of those pivotal moments in my life. Anyone who worked with me at Starbucks remembers me telling this story because there are moments in your life when you know that you are standing on the edge of one direction or the other. It's those two paths in the woods. And Anne, in response to my saying that I had had a conversation at a Starbucks where I was thinking of going in the coffee business could have answered two ways. What a stupid idea. Or she could say to me, wow, you love coffee so much. You're working as a photographer. You could do both and you'd probably love it. And so I went and applied for a job at Starbucks. And a week later, February 13th, 1995, I took my first class, which was the Starbucks experience. And, and I had from that day on 25 and a half of the most unbelievable years where I continued to have an opportunity to be a storyteller and a teacher. And I learned so much about coffee during those times because the people I worked with were so willing to, to give me so much. And that same passionate, curious guy that I described earlier 
was then in Starbucks and I was eating it up, drinking it up. And, and so I so had you, an amazing career. You rose through the ranks at Starbucks <laughs> though rather rapidly. I mean, why do you think that is? Was it drive, ambition, imagination? Uh, I, I have to be honest. I, I think at first it was because I was older and because I had a lot of experience and, and, and because I was, never, I was never shy. I very clearly, I knew from the very first time I sat with my district manager, I knew that I was not going to leave by choice, that they were going to have to get rid of me or I was going to work the rest of my life at Starbucks, my working life. And, and because, I, I, because I had this sense that I was going to be there, I had ideas. I had things that I thought were going to be, were going to work for me. Of course, I wanted to be promoted. I wanted to get more money. But at the same time, I felt as though I had a voice. I, I would tell you, almost every partner at Starbucks would say the same thing. They feel as though they have a voice. It's one of the wonderful things about the company. You may not be in a position as an executive, but you have an opportunity to say what you think. And oftentimes, especially in my case, people were willing to listen to what I had to say. And I, I came up with some ideas that people said, go back to work. We're not interested. But some of the things that I, that I came up with were actually things that in a way changed the direction of the company. They certainly changed the way that coffee was approached. And, and so I, I, got a, I got a great deal of reward for, for doing that. Um, and, and I did in fact move fairly quickly. I would tell you as well though, in 1995, people moved fairly quickly because the company was, was exhibiting such extreme growth that, that if, you, if you were delivering, if you were doing a good job, you had the next thing on your plate fairly quickly. I had to ask on behalf of all of the baristas I've ever loved. They wanted to know what was it about this guy that made him stand out? And I, I, I think you've, you've shared it. Um, so tell us a little bit about your history with Starbucks. You started as a barista, then you ended up in Seattle. How long did that take? And then what, what did you start doing in Seattle? It was eight years. I worked in Boston for eight years. I, I was a barista for really only a couple of weeks uh, because I was older and I was I had open availability. I got promoted to supervisor. Uh, I was a key holder. Two weeks. Uh, yeah. It, well, I, you know, it was one of those things. If you're opening markets fast and you're opening stores fast, you need people who can handle the key, open the store and close the store. And because I was older, and I remember the conversation when, when my manager and assistant manager, whose ages did not add up to mine, offered me a promotion to a supervisor. I said to them, standing in the back room of this store in Newton, Massachusetts, you guys are crazy. I have no idea what I'm doing. And yet you want to promote me. And they said, no, 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 you'll be great. And I, I know now that the only reason they really wanted me to do that is because I was the, I was the tallest pygmy. I was the one who was older, I had availability, and, I, and I, I, the risk was minimal for them. And the benefits were huge because they wouldn't have to open or close anymore because they'd have another person. And, and what I did immediately as a supervisor was to take advantage of the opportunity that I had because then I was in a position where I was responsible for the well-being of other people working. When you're a barista, you really are worried about yourself and your customers. But as a supervisor, I, I immediately loved the idea that, that if I was supervising, that that team was mine and that I was theirs. And one of the things that, that Starbucks has always embraced, which is so noble, is servant leadership. We could have a whole call about servant leadership, but essentially it, you, you operate with your team on their behalf and their well-being is going to is going to indicate your well-being and i totally understood that and loved it and so it wasn't well, long had, after you had 20 uh, years of servant leadership as a teacher exactly and and so it was perfect i i totally loved it and and i loved what i was able to do uh and not long after that i i was offered a job as a store manager i said i wasn't interested because remember that I'm still working as a freelance photographer. I'm booking a lot of jobs and I'm very busy and I wanna work 20 hours a week and get my medical benefits. And they want me to work 
40, 50, 60 hours a week and be a manager and get your own store. So I said no. And, and I, I, took the, I took the job anyways. I went into training. Ironically, my trainer was the young lady who recruited me, Lori Hare. She ended up being a manager and she was my trainer. And then I ended up back in my original store. And in my original store, to everyone's surprise, Major the barista slash supervisor was now the store manager. And that store in Newton sold more whole bean coffee than almost any store on the East Coast. So why did that happen? Because I had a great team and because I loved coffee so much, my team loved coffee so much that we had great success. So I went from manager to district manager and then I was, uh, I actually did a, a, a middle stint as a learning specialist where I was a teacher for Starbucks. And as a teacher for Starbucks for about two years, the operators, the people who own the business said, you should be, you should be in the business. You're, you can make more money for us as a, as a district manager with a whole team. And so I was given a district, 13 stores, uh, what, three or 400 people working for me. Um, more than $13 million worth of business in um, my 13 stores. Uh, Howard, Howard would like to know if you lost your hair because of Starbucks. And uh, I, 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 I was going to lose before. my hair anyways. If you saw my grandpa, <laughs> if you saw my grandpa, you'd say, you know what? He looks just like his grandpa, only he shaves it and grandpa didn't, didn't shave it. But I, 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 I th there's another story attached to my hair. That's really funny. When I made a film for Starbucks, if, if you're watching tonight and you want to see something funny, go online for the uh, for the Culinary School of America, the CIA, and look for me on their videos. And you'll see this guy with half half a head of hair, and it's a much younger me. But uh, those videos really convinced me that it was time to shave my head. At any rate, that that was that was all it took, and I'm awfully glad that I that I do that now. So so. Let's uh, let's get back on track here and have you tell us <laughs> what ended up in Seattle. And as part of that, I'm just going to let you tell a story. Um, in addition to how you ended up in Seattle, what they had you doing and talk about your travels in particular, because I think a lot of folks will be interested in that. When I was invited to join in Seattle uh, to, to move there, there was a small team that I had become really close with as a Starbucks employee. We call Starbucks employees or partners. Anyways, as a partner in Boston, I had, I had reached out to the coffee education team with great frequency. In fact, I, I sometimes joked that I was so much in their face with questions and concerns that part of the reason that they invited me to move to Seattle was to stop bothering them from Boston and I would then be part of their team so they could stifle me. At any rate, I joined this very small team uh, that has been part of Starbucks now for, uh, God, probably close to 30, 35 years. It's a really unique team, Kelly, because it's a team of coffee educators, most of whom don't really do the work of coffee, nor have they ever done the work. And when I say the work of coffee, think about all the things that go into getting it, roasting it, and delivering it, to simplify it. So I was never a buyer. I, I was never a, uh, a sampler officially in my role to select coffees. I didn't ever roast coffee that people would consume as, as customers. So I never really did the work of coffee, nor did anyone on this team. But the responsibility the team had was to know all of the work that goes in to coffee so that they could help people learn. Coffee education, coffee education at Starbucks, a small team. I joined that team. And one of the first things that I was given as an opportunity was here in the United States. And I traveled to a number of the cities as we were beginning to grow out the business in the United States. And I, I provided coffee education based on material that the, team, that the team had created over the years. And that turned into an international position uh, because as we grew internationally, we needed support 
for coffee education in, in those faraway markets. And I was, I was more than willing to, to take on that opportunity. And so I became a coffee educator. And as the years went on, I also became an effective brand ambassador. And so in my final, in my final few years at Starbucks, I was a coffee educator and brand ambassador because I understood, I understood the, the magic of what Starbucks was doing. And I, I knew a great deal about coffee. You were building coffee culture though. I mean, when you talk about education, you're shifting countries, cultural uh, perceptions of coffee. No question about it. And, and now if you think about, if you go and, and look back, one of the things that I realized towards the end of my time at Starbucks was that I have been, I have lived through the entire history of the business that is today coffee. And when I say that, obviously coffee has been a business for quite quite a long time. If you know hundreds the history, and hundreds goes, and hundreds, yeah, of hundreds, years. And, you know. Yeah. And so, but but there's a there's a that pivotal moment that I talked about, which happens in in the late '60s, early '70s, when this thing that we call specialty coffee begins. And when specialty coffee begins, I'm I'm that school teacher in in Boston, and I'm discovering that this coffee connection this new company from Seattle called Starbucks. And now, this, this many years later, I realize that I've lived through all 50 some years of this business. And I Coffee spent evolution. that- yeah. Right, but I spent that 25 years with, with really the company that, Starbucks was the company that blew it up, that made it yeah. culturally so broad. And so I was there, I was part of that. And I had an opportunity to be, to be learning and also to be a teacher. So if there was one event in that 25 and a half year long copy career um, that highlights it, highlights your career, what would that be? I mean, aside from this particular chat, obviously, because I, I know this is a huge- <laughs> Yeah, this is it. This is, no, I, this this is, is it. This, this is, is this the is one pinnacle. highlight exactly. your yeah. career. Yeah. yeah. So I, I'll, I'll tell you a funny story uh, that, that's sort of sideways. The, one of the things that I, ha I always believed in was the power of, of the people. It, 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 the business, no matter who you're going to get coffee from, there's most likely there's a person. And if you have a good experience, most likely you enjoyed that experience and you got something good. And so I have always understood and because I was a barista, I've always understood the power and, and the unheralded role of being a barista. And one of the things that I really wanted to accomplish in the last five or so years when I was at Starbucks I felt as though we had an opportunity to celebrate the role of the barista in a larger way. And I talked with, at that time, I had a fantastic, fantastic mentor and boss. Jeff Miller was his name. And we both understood what I just described to you. And, and we said, how can we do this? How can we elevate the role for the barista? And the way to do that is is through education, through certifications, through things that allow them to to feel more like a professional than they perhaps did. And so one of the things that we that we decided was that we would we would perhaps bring Starbucks closer to the Specialty Coffee Association, which is an international organization that is the sanctioning organization for specialty coffee in many, many ways with roasting and with buying, but with barista education as well. And he asked me to look into something. And so I looked into what it would take to become a trainer for the Specialty Coffee Association. Now you have to understand, Starbucks has no need for this. They don't need one person who is a trainer or a group of people who is a trainer, but it would be kind of a first step in taking the company a little bit closer yeah. to this idea of, of, of elevating the role of the barista. So I, 
I looked into it and I got back to Jeff and I said, here's what I can do. I can take the classes. I can go back to school, if you will, and study coffee from the Specialty Coffee Association. And then if I get, if I pass, if I become a certified trainer, then I can begin to bring that into the organization. So he said, wow, do you want to do that? And I said, well, I do, if you want to pay for it, because it's not inexpensive, it takes a lot of hours. And right. so the reason I thought of that when you asked me this question is because I had not been in school since RIT in 1973. Oh. And now I'm back in classes and, and this barista education, in order to be certified as an AST is what they call the role, it's very rigorous. And it's rigorous, not only in the information that you have to learn, but perhaps the hardest thing of all is that you have to be able to demonstrate skills as a barista behind the bar that I, I haven't done that in quite a few years. And so I went back to school and I did all my studying and I, I, got, to the, uh, I got to the final exam, if you will. And in one of the final exams, you have, to, you have to make beverages for a certifying instructor who you don't know. And you have to make quite a few beautiful beverages in a very small amount of time. I failed. I failed the first time. Oh. And I was, I was devastated because you had a, you got it. There's no AST if I don't pass. So I yeah. called Jeff. I was in Seattle. He was in Singapore. I called him up. I said, I failed the test. And he said, well, that's too bad. You knew it was going to be hard. I'm disappointed. I'm sure you are as well. And he said, what do you want to do? And I said, well, I want to take the test again, but it's going to cost a lot of money. I have to sign up and, and I have to study again because I clearly didn't have enough to pass the test. Just to get a 90 to pass the test. And, and oh. I would share with you, my first score was 76. So there was a good gap there. So I studied again, I worked for a couple of months and I went here in Seattle to take the test a second time. And you know what I'm gonna tell you, I did better, but I failed a second time. No. <laughs> yeah. And now I can take the test one more time to pay again, but now I'm on a time limit because all of the work you did before has to culminate in passing the exam within a certain time frame, or you have to start over oh. again. Understood. So I, I took the test a third time. And the moment that I would tell you that I, I felt like personally, it was one of the most significant accomplishments. And I knew in the moment that it was going to mean something for so many baristas. I took the test a third time. I did really well the third time uh, and I passed. I got this license and we, Jeff and I, immediately began to bring coffee education elements from the SCA into Starbucks Asia. And, and I know without a doubt that if we had a dozen of those partners whose lives we touched with this education, that it had an impact and even more, I'm gone, but I know that impact is living on. And so we planted the seed at that time that is significantly important for the lives of baristas. And if you're gonna touch, if you're gonna touch a cadre of baristas, think about who's got the largest cadre of baristas in the world, Starbucks. So, so that's, that's impact. We had impact on the lives of those people. And now today I've taught, an, I've taught a number of classes for the SCA. I've now taught classes that weren't related to Starbucks. And so as a teacher, I have, a, I have a new avenue that I can explore teaching pretty high level coffee skills, which you miss Rochester? Will, I, I have, I, some, you could definitely, yeah, there, there's some really good cafes in Rochester now. Yes, there are. So, well, where were you and what were you doing when you had the best cup of coffee you've ever had in your life? I mean, I can pinpoint, mine was, an Irish coffee after I had just finished climbing the Belfry in Bruges, Belgium, which damn nice. near killed me. And I got back down and I had an Irish coffee and it started to snow and it was the best tasting right. cup I've ever had. Yeah, it sounds fantastic. And I, and I, I, I love that experience. And I've always wanted to, 
I've always wanted to go to Bruges, and uh, so I'm going to get there sometime in the next couple of years, I hope. Uh, for me, I was in a, uh, we were training some uh, coffee baristas uh, in a facility in Shanghai called Jazz Cafe. And it's a wonderful, wonderful training center. It's an authorized SCA, specialty coffee training center. And I had met the owner of Jazz Cafe eight years ago in a store. I, I built a concept store here in Seattle that was not branded Starbucks, but it was a Starbucks. It was a test store that I was responsible for the test. At any rate, I met the owner and I had not seen him for seven or eight years. And I was walking through his facility in between classes and he saw me and I can't hide very well in Asia, especially. And so he came running over and he said, Major, what are you doing here? And I, I told him that I was training, that we had rented his facility. And he said, you have to come and taste some coffee with me. And I said, his name is Jason. I said, Jason, I don't have any time right now. I'm supposed to go to Shanghai downtown to our roastery. And, I, and so he, he said, no, no, you must come. And so the next thing I knew, a colleague and I were headed into his lab where he served us a cup of coffee that was, it was from a, it was from a company called 90 plus, but it happened to be the coffee that Jason's son served in the World Brewing Championships. And it was the winning coffee and he was the winning brewer. And Jason wanted us to taste it. It was a, it was a geisha varietal. And I remember I picked up the cup and I smelled it. And right away I knew that it was, there was something extraordinary going on. And when I tasted it, I loved peaches. And I got this, this note of peaches that was, it was extraordinary. And I started to take a sip and my colleague said, peaches. She said the same thing. And so two of us are standing there talking about peaches and sweetness. Uh, it, was a, it was a great coffee and I'll, ne I'll never forget it. I had it one other time and it was equally it was equally delicious. And the second time I had it, I got to brew it. Hey. And I got to brew it for some people back at Starbucks headquarters. And they also said, this is one of the greatest coffees that I have ever tasted. All right, so do I need to go to Shanghai for that or Seattle? No, or? It, it, in fact, we can't get that coffee. It, 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 oh. That coffee, the problem, the problem with that coffee and many coffees like it is that they're very, very limited and they, you, they're usually going today to barista competitors who bring them to the world stage and compete with them. They're very, very small amounts of coffee. You're, you're talking about maybe 80 or 100 pounds of coffee. Whoa. So now you're talking more along the lines of uh, Pappy Van Winkle and uh, whiskey <laughs> yes. and the availability or lack of availability for, for that. No idea. That's fascinating. Yep. Um, you know, people signed on uh, to make sure that they heard a little bit about uh, how your career evolved, your background, but they also want to hear about the fact that you are a newly published author. Congratulations. Thank so you. proud of you. Yeah, thank and you. Uh, for, for those of you that haven't seen it, this is Coffee for Dummies and uh, is available at Shop One Square on the RIT campus. And uh, you can just check that out on the web as well. We'll, we'll. we'll give you that at the end. But I'd like you to share how the book came to be. Um, I mean, here you are. And, and working for, for Starbucks for this long and, and traveling all over Asia and you're back in Seattle. So what happens? How did, how did this happen? You know, I, again, I think it was, it, it sort of seems like a natural sequence. I was, uh, I was sitting at Starbucks one day and I got a call from someone from Nestle's and Starbucks and Nestle's have a wonderful collaboration. And this person had been in a class they didn't know me, but they had been in one of the classes that I, that I taught for Nestle's. And they shared with me a wonderful story about having been at a dinner party with someone from Wiley Publishing. 
Wiley is the company that owns the Dummies franchise. Mm -hmm. Okay. And in, in conversation, this person in the coffee business said to the Wiley person, has Wiley ever published a coffee for dummies? And the person answered no. And this person said, I met this guy in a class who would probably be a great author for you if he was interested in writing the book. Do you want me to call him? And so they were calling me and I had not thought specifically about writing a book, but I've had a number of people say to me over the years, you should write a book. And so when Wiley called me, I was I was thrilled, I was honored, but I said to them immediately, I work full time for Starbucks and unless Starbucks asked me to write a book, I'm not writing a book today or tomorrow, but I'd be really interested. And then of course, when COVID began a year ago and I was sitting in Seattle and my job was in Asia, I'm, I'm over 70 years old now. So I had been thinking about retiring. I was looking at the prospect of potentially being home and not really being able to work, but working for home on a job in Asia, I, I said, I think I'm going to, I think I'm going to retire and stop working. Uh, and so I put the wheels in motion. And then I called Wiley and said, as of June 1st, I'm not working anymore. Would you still like to work on a book? And they said, absolutely. We would love to have you write this book. And so Simultaneous with my retirement, I was assigned an editor and a number of deadlines, and I was on my way to writing Coffee for Dummies. So were you given any specific directives from the Dummies <laughs> organization? Yeah. On I, 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 would, I would say that I was. Uh, I, I, in fact, it was a huge transition for me. Anyone who knew me at Starbucks knew that for over 10 years, I had had wonderful leaders who had indulged my ideas to a huge degree. I rarely had pressure from a boss. In fact, I would tell you that I probably pressured them more often than they pressured me because I was impatient and I had ideas of what we should be doing. And in, in a large way, they supported those. Well, now I was working for Wiley. I was working for my editor. I was working for the managing director of this project. And I was, I was really struggling because I was not accustomed to working under deadlines. I was not accustomed to being told that the 20 pages that I submitted were okay, but they were way off the mark and that I needed to do them again. And so the next thing I knew, I was in a moment where, and I'll be honest, I thought I was going to stop. I was going to quit. I was going to tell Wiley, you know, this was a nice idea, but I don't think I want to do it. And then I didn't do that. I, I said, come on, you can do this to myself, of course. And so I, I learned something though, which was uh, really valuable because here I was someone who prided himself on thinking that I could make things simple. And quite honestly, if you are familiar with dummies or you've had a chance to, and I know you've read through Coffee for Dummies, but one of the things that their franchise offers the reader is an opportunity not to feel like a dummy, to have things so simple that you can at least dive in. And the more you dive in, the more you either find other avenues to explore or those avenues are actually present right in the book. But that to me was something they taught me that, that I, I think it makes Coffee for Dummies successful. And I think it will make Coffee for Dummies what I, what I hoped it would be, which is, which is it's not necessarily for the coffee aficionado. If, if you're a coffee aficionado, there's a few things in there that I would, I pride myself in thinking that I included some things that'll be interesting. But I joked with some people who I worked with at Starbucks, this is the book to give to your, to your mom and dad who are drinking crappy coffee. But, but you want them to know a little bit more so that they can maybe understand that there's something more out there and once they understand there's something more out there, there's a world of, of stories that are attached to coffee. And there are avenues and doors you can open that, that there's probably nothing more romantic than coffee when you really dig in to that as a, as That's a commodity. That's what I wanted to say was my impression about the book. This is gonna sound weird. Um, 
But when you and I first talked about this, you said, don't read it. Please just don't read it. It's a, it's a resource book. It's a textbook for coffee. And I thought, well, you know what? I'm still going to at least crack the book open and surprise myself. And I ended up in the middle of the book where there really is stories throughout where coffee um, intrigue, murder, mystery, you know, that kind of thing. Uh, and history of coffee was actually my favorite portion of the book. I loved seeing how coffee, where it started, how it traveled across the globe and how you injected specific um, uh, instances and individual stories uh, between people. Um, I, I just loved it. So do you have a you. chapter in the book? You know, you you pointed out the two things. I talked a little bit about uh, about sort of the differentiators. There's a lot of great books in coffee. I have a great library of wonderful, wonderful books and friends that have written books that I, I called them up and said, this is the greatest book could ever be written. What I really wanted to do was to make it possible for a consumer today to understand where what we enjoy today came from. And what I know about the where it came from is that it, it is people, it is people heavy. It doesn't happen without wonderful, wonderful people making, making some crazy decisions and doing things to bring coffee to a different place. And the most, think of it as the most, the simplification. We, we were drinking bad coffee until 1970, 1969 or 70. And then because of a series of choices that people made, the coffee got better that was being brought to consumers. And quite honestly, it was because those entrepreneurs believed that it was possible and that people would like it. Well, people like it. If you've been drinking bad coffee, at first, when you start to drink better coffee, you think, well, this doesn't taste like my coffee. I'm not gonna like this. But then what happens is you begin to understand some of the subtleties, nuances, and you begin to understand that you like the taste. And then what happens if, if you're a little bit curious, then, then you can begin to dig in because you wonder where did that taste come from? Why does that happen? And then you might wonder who, who are the people? Who are the people involved? And then you might wonder, is this something that is environmentally sound or is this something that is counter to the future of our environment exactly. is unsustainable? Yeah. And all of those things are the questions that I hoped to address through the people. And yeah. I have my favorite chapter and I, 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 you, you and I talked about this. My favorite chapter really is the chapter in which I got to talk about not only the famous people because I highlight some of those people as well. Many of them I know, many of them I worked with. And so I can, I can share a little bit about those stories personally, but I share some stories about people who are unsung heroes in coffee who represent hundreds, if not thousands of people like them who make great decisions on behalf of us consumers every day. It's, it was just a fabulous resource because once I started in one section of the book, and you, you, you end up de developing additional questions and then you wonder if they'll be in there and they are. And so you can read it from front to back, but it was just so much more fun hopping in and out. And um, it, it, it was just, it was just so very easy. I think you said that too. You want to make it as simple as possible. And I, I think you did. Um, I'd like to take a quick moment here and have you answer a couple of coffee related questions from right. our audience. They're sort of coming fast and furious yeah, here. I, I had a feeling that often happens, you know, so <laughs> I, I think we'll never have enough time, Kelly, but you guys, uh, you guys have my email address and any question that isn't answered, if you would just forward it over to me, uh, if you have someone's email or, or a way to connect them to me, I'd be more than happy sure. to sit and answer questions. And I'll, I'll take care of that at the, the conclusion Great. of this. Um, we do have, a question, I mean, you talk a lot in the book about climate and environment and the impact that it has on uh, coffee being growth. Um, we have a question here that says, what water quality should be considered for a great brew? So this 
so there, there's a simple way to look at that and there's a whole science and so <laughs> i'm going to give you the simple and tell you that you can learn the science if you want to if if one if one is going to brew coffee and that person is willing to drink the water that comes out of their tap then i would recommend that they make coffee with that water and so water is the most important ingredient in a cup of coffee it represents 98 plus of a cup of coffee if your water tastes bad in any way you cannot brew coffee with it because that bad taste will end up in your coffee if you like your water you can use water now yeah there's so find can, the water you enjoy the yeah. most and you, you can, can do you can that. use you can use uh bottled water but you have to be careful with bottled water you can't use distilled water because distilled water doesn't have the things in it that you need to make coffee so, yeah and you interestingly today there's a product on the market called third wave water and you can make perfect water for coffee you take a gallon of distilled water you put one packet from third wave water into this distilled water shake it up and you have exactly what coffee brewers believe is the perfect water for coffee okay i've used it i've you used put it that in the notes then i, it, I it's wanted not it, that it's out. not better than the water that i that i get here in seattle so i didn't notice a big difference in the coffee i brewed but i've used it in places where in asia where there is not such great water and it okay. totally great. makes a difference great good to know um here's another one has the has the way caffeine content is measured changed or evolved over the years or is it constant within you mean the measurement of caffeine has been has been fairly consistent i'm not i'm not yeah. really schooled on on the science of that measurement i know the general numbers that are associated with caffeine and uh i don't i don't think there's been any changes however like all science i'm sure there's been advancements so if there's a caffeine science scientists in the audience they're probably thinking oh my god of course it's changed well everything has really changed because we we've become more scientifically advanced uh josh owen from our center for design studies at rit my good friend sure that you knew that the the that rit houses a working espresso machine there that awaits your next visit good yeah that, we're going to do this in person at rit uh, because the one thing, as wonderful as it is to spend time with everybody this way, uh, the one thing we're all missing is is coffee together. And uh, and I hope, yeah, I hope that that I hope everyone who's listening in and and chose to watch today that I get a chance to have coffee with you sometime in person because you know that, we'll, that we'll, would round this out. We will make that happen at the Lavazza Alumni House. We've got the perfect place for it. Good. I have another question for you. It's um, they're asking you to expand on the cold brew and options for lower acid coffee. Okay. Is cold brew lower acid than drip brew? Yeah, I, I think I think it is perceived by people who are drinking it. It has less uh, it has less acidity in flavor, and so there are, there are many who who would drink who drink it and tell you that it doesn't bother their stomach as much um, because the way that it's being brewed is is definitely changing the way that it delivers in inside when you drink it uh there's something interesting about coffee that i i would share and that is that oftentimes there's there's a huge element that's your mind is creating i, I don't i'm not going to tell you that there's not any scientific reason to believe that cold brew is is less acid than others but if your mouth combines with your brain to tell you something like i think this is going to mess my stomach up a little more it's probably going to mess your stomach up a little more and so cold brew when you drink it it's because it is extracted with no heat and time and coffee water contact is what makes cold brew it's 12 or 14 hours of brewing and so what happens is that the extraction what is pulled out of those 
coffee grounds into the liquid that's then served is going to have different taste characteristics. And cold brew is generally described as sweeter and smoother and very thirst quenching. And because of the long extraction often has a little bit, a little bit more caffeine, always has when well brewed has a good flavor, a big, bigger flavor. So it's, uh, it's interesting with brewing because no matter what you do brewing, you're probably going to enhance something that the coffee had the capacity to put into the water you started with, but you're also gonna lose some things. So I, I understand and love cold brew, but one of the things about cold brew that I, that I don't care for is that it diminishes some of the flavors and the, the acidic notes, the, the tartness that coffee might have and so I, so I understand it. Personal preference. Yeah, exactly. And it's yeah. always a personal preference. I, I emphasize this in, in Coffee for Dummies over and over and over again. No matter what, the most important thing for you when you're, when you're going to have coffee, no matter what people tell you, no matter what they say, no matter how it's brewed, taste the coffee. If you like it, then you're on a good track. If you don't like it, the rest of it is, is meaningless. And, and so that's always got to be the most important thing. So we have a, just a couple of minutes left here, Major. I can't believe how fast this has flown yeah, by. I told this, you, you know, it's, I said we should plan four hours, so. Yeah, well, between the two of us, yeah. So I want to ask you uh, this last question, um, and then what we'll do is I'll share all the questions that people asked that we didn't have time to answer today, and, and we'll get some answers out to everyone um, post-event here. Uh, so what is the next coffee chapter in Major's life going to be? Uh, are, you've written this book. What's next? Well, I'm going to do some traveling. Uh, I'm going to continue to do teaching with the Specialty Coffee Association. Uh, I've, I've had some, uh, and I shared with you yesterday, I, I, had a, uh, I had a request to write an article for Coffee Talk magazine, which was just published uh, last week. So uh, I, I never fancied myself a writer and I'm, I'm more of a coffee brewer than a writer, but I wrote this thing and it, people liked it. So I'm gonna continue to do some writing. Uh, I've, I'm in a discussion, thanks to, thanks to Lisa and, and you guys at RIT, I, I'm, I'm thinking about another book uh, because I think there's an opportunity. Uh, I'm, I'm still a photographer and I have, uh, I have a lot of photography that I'd love to share and, and maybe couple with some things that I write. And, uh, and I'm beginning to do some consulting uh, because I realize and others have realized that I, I'm not afraid to share my opinion and I, I know a lot about coffee now. Uh, and so uh, I'm thrilled about those opportunities because I, I feel as though I have, a, I, have additional, uh, I have additional work I can do with other people who are exploring things in coffee to make them successful. And so, well, I, uh, I will tell you too that you have several invitations for a cup of coffee in Phoenix, in Rochester, that great. sort of popping up here. Um, Major, I just want to say thank you so much for sharing your passion and your expertise with us. We're, we're grateful that you join us. I can't wait to see you in person. Uh, thank you too to our interpreters um, and our captioner. Very much sure. appreciated that you were here this evening. If you're interested in purchasing the Coffee for Dummies by Dean Major Cohen, please check out Shop One on the RIT campus. That hot link is going to be in the chat box as well. Please remember that all audience members will receive an email from us with a link to tonight's webinar recording. And remember too, that these Tiger webinars are available on the RIT Alumni Association YouTube site. The link is in the chat box as well. So feel free to catch up on past events if you like. You can do a full listing of upcoming virtual events at www.rit.edu slash alumni slash events. We have several each month and we'd love to include you in as many of these as possible. Our next one is slated for June 9th at 6 p.m. Eastern Standard Time and features Harlan Doolittle, class of 14, 2014. He's a Los Angeles-based visual effects uh, film editor and will share their journey from RIT to overseeing visual effects on 
American Horror Story and Netflix acclaimed The Prom and many others. Uh, the registration link is also in the chat box. Again, thank you, Major, and thank you. Thank you, Kelly. Guests joining us this evening. Uh, do let us know what you thought of this webinar by emailing me. And if you have any questions for Major, you can send them to me as well, and I'll make sure that they end up in his hands. My email is kelly, K-E-L-L-Y, dot redder, R-E-D-D-E-R, at R-I-T dot E-D-U. Again, thank you for joining us. Please exit this webinar by simply closing your browser window. Have a wonderful week. Stay safe, stay positive, stay your course, and enjoy that next cup of coffee. Great. Thank you. Kelly, thank you. Oh, Major, I had so much fun. And yeah, I me too. It's, it did go by fast. I, I'm you know, sitting here thinking, wow, that was an hour? That was an hour, and uh, I timed each section, and I killed off an entire one on the writing process. Yeah. I just, we just didn't have time for it. No, that's um, right. And uh, I just wanted to let you know there are so many folks that were sending you messages that I'll make sure that I download those. Oh, uh, cool. Yeah, I saw, I, for sure, them. I saw Japan. There's at least three people from Japan and uh, yeah. I think Indonesia. So I, I knew that some of them, and I, as I said earlier, I, I know some people from my family were on board. So, Shojiro, Shojiro. Yeah, Shojiro is in Tokyo. Yeah. And uh, Bridget Luca is- Canada. Missouri, and uh, and uh, Victoria Kaiser is like, what a rich hour. This was wonderful. Thank you. All the best major from A's, I think. Uh, oh, Aisha, Aisha, yeah, Aisha, yeah, um, and you know Tony was fantastic, and um, Jeanette. Uh, I mean, there, there's just there's just a ton of comments, and I'll make awesome. sure to get a copy of them because they uh, really are lovely, and it just shows us just how beloved you are, <laughs> and and I can't thank you enough. I don't. Oh, no, thank you. Right this was super fun. And, uh, like this in a long no, time. the next time. We'll definitely do it in person because uh, I have Please. to get to Rochester. Uh, I I, I want to see my family and now I can come and visit with you guys and we can have coffee at the alumni house and uh, we can put together something. I'd love to do a coffee tasting. That would be super fun. Yeah, yeah and John, um, if you'll unmute yourself. Uh, you know, I, I think this is a wonderful event. I hope you enjoyed it as well. Um, you're still muted for some reason. Let's see. John, did you have any questions that we didn't answer? Uh, can you guys hear me now? Yeah. Yes. Okay. Um, no, I thought, actually, you know, I like the stories the best, like hearing your story about the way, like coming up and growing up in the early 90s and, and into like the mid 90s, like watching the rise of, of, of Starbucks and hearing how you got to be a part of that, I thought was just fascinating. Yeah, cool. Oh, thank yeah, you. That was, that was cool. And I appreciate it. I'm a cold brew drinker and I appreciated your insights on that. That yeah. was cool. Oh, I'm glad. Good. Glad. And uh, I think the interpreters, I, I'm afraid we both talked so much. I hope we didn't. Yeah, really we made hard work. So thank you guys so much. Jam this it was... in there. Um, and it looks like there's still several people on the webinar. So um, I just want to say again, thank you. Major. Thank you. No, it was, it's, Thank it, you. it was a lovely, lovely time. And yeah. I really do just want to hit the road with you. Um, awesome. Honest to gosh. <laughs> yeah. We have to do it. We have to do it in person at RIT. That would be fantastic. We'll start there and then hit right. the road. I mean, yep, indeed. Actually, so thank you guys. Hook, thank you guys so much. Happy photography. Yeah, thanks, <laughs> Major. Yeah. All right. Thanks, John. Good night, everyone. Go. Take care, everyone. Good night. Thank you have again, nice you guys. Thank you. Take care.